Tonight is May the 24th, 2017, and uh, I've been asked a, a number of questions lately, and I'll give you my thoughts and uh, experience on it and show you why I do and believe what I do and believe uh, from, from the amplifiers that I've built and tested for, for many years. Uh, one question that was asked of me is uh, how do you use these characteristic curves I hope this thing is going to not be overwhelmed there you go the characteristic curves here to determine things like uh, output transformer impedance I mean how do you really get it down to the nitty-gritty and uh, the answer is basically I think these things are worthless for the things that we use and I'll tell you why uh, first of all uh, these curves right here, if you notice right here on a push-pull class AB2 amplifier, if you use that and you use these curves up here, you're going to see that what they have the plate voltage at is 360 and they have the screen voltage at 270. They're essentially running this 6L6 as a tetrode. We know it's a beam power pentode. We know that that's its name. Well, let's call it a beam power tube. That's probably the right thing to call it, isn't it? Because it has beam forming plates for the third grid. It does not actually have a third grid. The only power tube that comes to my mind that has a, indeed three real grids is the EL34. But anyway, this is nothing about particularly the 606 or the EL34. But, but these curves are, for all practical purposes, they're worthless. Because you're not going to be running the plate current, I mean, the, excuse me, the uh, screen voltage at 270 and 360 on the plate. You're going to be hooking this thing up as a triode. You're going to, whether it's ultra linear or not, you're going to be, odds are, running it as a triode. Now, if you run bigger tubes like, say, a 6550 as a tetrode, or a beam power tube or whatever you want to call it and you say run the plate voltage at 800 volts and then you run whatever the recommended screen voltage is and you should run whatever the recommended screen voltage should be uh, you'll get a lot more power out of it but then you you've got the complications so what does it boil down to it boils down to uh, you can do all of the tedious work you want on determining what the output transformer impedance should be, but in the end, you're basically going to select between what's made, and what's made are, are, are values like 2K, 4K, 5K, 5K is the most popular in the world, 6.6K uh, .6 and an 8K. I mean, you can get other values, we know that, but you're probably going to be using a 5 or a 6.6K, .6 odds are. And that's what you're stuck with. I mean, if you if you do all of the, you know, if you do all your homework and due diligence and, and you just design this thing down to the last electron and decide that you need a transformer that's, uh, you know, uh, 5,118.77 ohms, well, it doesn't really matter. And not only that, you, uh, I'm sorry I closed the book here, but um, I wanted to show you some other things, but you also have to remember that... Uh, these transformer impedances that we're determining from, from, from this data, looking at the curves, whatever, are static conditions. And under dynamic conditions, everything is changing enormously by at least a factor of two. So there's just no, you know, unless you're going to build a, a, an amplifier that produces one sine wave, you know, uh, forever and it's not going to do anything else then uh, I guess you could custom tweak that one I don't know how you're going to custom tweak a transformer unless you've got a transformer winding facility or you got somebody that can build these things to your specs but then that's a whole new career in itself you know we just can't be uh, we just can't do something so something we just have to be satisfied with I look at these amplifiers almost like cars. I think like, I may have even rattled on about this one time in a video and that is um, if we want to, if we as uh, amateurs, if we want to make our car run faster, say you know we have uh, drag racing as a hobby, 
unless we're really good at it, there's not much we can change. You know, and, and as a non-automobile expert, what can I change on my car? All I can change on it is the flare. You know, I can change the hubcaps. I can put some chrome knobs on it and and chrome uh, intake cover for, for the uh, for the motor. But I, I can't really do anything about changing the pistons from one thing to another to titanium, etc. I, I hope I'm not being too absurd and boring here, but there's just so many things we can do. With that said, there are a lot of things we can do, and they're not that hard. And I believe I have discovered a lot of them. I've read about them. I've heard about them from you guys. Just there's an enormous amount of information available. And some of it's really good, and some of it's really bad. So you have to kind of filter through that. But uh, I, I certainly enjoy making these videos and the conversations and debates that we have uh, here on YouTube. They're, they're fascinating. They're, they're very enlightening. I learned something so much every time. Okay, well let me show you what I think and what I've experienced and what I can put right here in front of us and measure and show you how you can improve things. Now this is a little, uh, excuse me, this is a little Macintosh MA230 uh, uh, amplifier that I built in 1977. We had this thing, it was built about October, so it's not quite 40 years old. I got this transformer from Mac. I've shown this a number of times. It's just an outstanding amplifier. It was originally designed for some 7591s, but this thing loves 7591s, but you have to reconfigure the socket. Or 6L6s, or 6550s, or these EL34s. I happen to like the EL34s, that's why they're in there. But they all work the same, virtually the same. Uh, I mean, I've, you know we've got the equipment here to measure the smallest of nuances in these amplifiers and the difference between all of those tubes, between those three tubes in this amplifier are really hard to distinguish. So you, you, you don't have to, uh, uh, you know, settle on one tube. Now one of the things you do have to be careful about, you can change your tubes out in here, but you will have to watch very carefully and be able to adjust the uh, idling bias on it, because if you can't do that, you're just going to hurt your amplifier, and you're not going to get the results that you really want. So, what I'm suggesting here, that changes that we can make, we can learn from what other people have designed, of course. Let's look at the schematic of this uh, of this Mac amp. What I've got out here is I, we're going to look at a Williamson amplifier. This is a Fisher amplifier, a 70A. I haven't brought it out yet. I will. We're going to look at uh, well, this is a, the Williamson amplifier with the 12AU7s. The original Williamson amplifier, if you go way back, they used a 6SL7 here. And a 6SN7. The 6L, 6SL7 was the, basically the predecessor to the 12AX7. And the 6SN7 was the predecessor to the 12AU7. I hope I say all this right because uh, YouTube doesn't allow me to put in speech bubbles anymore. So if I say something stupid, then well, we'll just have to discuss it. Now this is the amplifier. This is the schematic to the MA230. And, um, well, let's start here for a second. Let's look at this amplifier, and there are some com components in here that you see just characteristically in all of the amps. And they nearly, just virtually every one of them, for this amplifier right here, for this phase inverter, you know, so that you got to, so that you got your signal uh, out of phase, 180 degrees out of phase. They nearly always put an asterisk by these, this one and this one, and say they want them to be matched pairs. Well, that's really dandy, and that's probably a good idea because you wouldn't want them to be 10% and have this one, if, assuming they were 100Ks, just for the sake of keeping our numbers in our head easy, one could be 90K and one could be 110, and I'm sure that balance would be pretty hideous. 
So they tell you to put in matched pairs. Well, matched pairs is really not the best answer because you're not going to get balanced driving signals right here with these being the same. It's important that this tube be good, but I don't care how good it is, if these are exactly the same, this signal and this signal is not going to be of the same amplitude. So you need to make one of them variable. Another thing, well, this one right here is not the, not the example for that. And um, let me see here. I'm going so fast. Here's how Fisher did it. You see how they made this one out here 100K? Right here. Then they made this one 68K and a 50K. So, you know, this, this is those same two resistors that they would put asterisks by in that other one to match perfectly. But they made this one variable, and it matters. It works. It will lower your distortion. Let me see here. They don't do it here. Okay. Well, let's get down to some uh, nitty-gritty measurements. Okay. What I've got the uh, scope probes hooked up to right now, right here, they're clipped underneath to the grids of these two tubes. I don't want to turn it over because I don't want to disturb everything and electrocute myself. And what we're going to do is... Uh, Look at them here. I'm going to have to take the camera off. I know, I know, I get some complaints about not having a really steady camera, but I'll do the best I can here. Got to take it off and look at these signals. Those are the signals on the grids of the tubes. Let's see. Now, I can't. I don't want to start fooling with too much of the oscilloscope because the oscilloscope's not the point point is an amplifier and you can see this is the, this is one grid and this is the other grid and you can see that they're 180 degrees out of phase and they're they're equal in amplitude I mean you can see it you can measure it uh, if you put the um, oscilloscope in uh, add what we end up getting is if we can get a good sync out here there's uh, Sorry about the sink level there, but you know, what is this thing trying to tell me? Is it about to blow up on me? I'll forget about the sink. But anyway, look here. There's one signal, there's the other signal, and there's the sum of the two signals. Zero. That's what you want. Hope you understand what I mean here by uh, adding them. If I invert one, I don't want to invert it because they're already inverted. Well, let's take the add off. And we get our Oops, I took channel one off to take our ad off. There we get our signals back. I don't know why I didn't, couldn't get it in sync. If we do invert it, if I can push the right button, well then see there they are. That smack on top of each other. This is good. Now, as good as this may be, this is oftentimes not what we get. And this little amplifier right here, I've got it set up and we'll do very quick measurements on it. It's rated at 30 watts. There it is, 31.24 watts. There it is again. Same number, 31.24 watts. And it's 0.2% at uh, two, till, 2 kilohertz. It'll actually, let's see, we can drive it quite a bit harder. Let's run it up to about 1%. Watching our THD right there. There's 1%. Whoops, that's a little over. Let's be really conservative here. Keeping it right below, that's below one. It'll do actually 40 watts. And it'll do it 20 to 20 kilohertz. We're not here to uh, to uh, play with the amplifier, but you see that the signal stayed, stayed equal. They stayed a nice clean sine wave. Now, one of the things that you will see in amplifiers, and it's kind of interesting, is oftentimes these signals can be hideously distorted and unequal and yet at the output of the transformer where the voice coil of your speaker goes at the output side of your transformer it's cleaned up it's cleaned up by all the negative feedback 16 to 20 db is pretty normal so you've got a lot of feedback and that cleans the amplifier up okay now that's one amplifier and you can see how clean it is this amplifier has the types of things that you really want on it, 
you can build this into any vacuum tube amplifier. You can adjust, you, right here, this V1 adjust individually the, uh, the, uh, the voltage, the uh, bias voltage on this tube. This pot adjusts individually the bias voltage on this tube. And this pot right here is that variable resistor that I, that I showed you in there. Oh, the way that they do it is ever so slightly different. And uh, you might want to look at this. You can find all of this stuff online so easy. Look at the way they do it. I can't point and... Okay. Now see, this is that variable resistor right there. Now they got a different kind of phase inverter because this tube right here is cathode driving this tube. This tube right here is effectively a grounded grid amplifier because if you follow this and you look at that capacitor right there, a capacitor of um, 0.25 I guess is what it is, essentially grounds all of the audio signal but it allows the bias to stay on it. So this is a little bit of a fancy or configuration than most. But what this one is actually allowing you to do is, is vary these two. In this case, it, it's not that, that split inverter like I showed a while ago. But I'm going to show you uh, that in the Dynaco. Here's the Dynaco Mark III. I love Dynacos. Had these things for years. Uh, I remember as a kid, uh, they were referred to as the poor man's Macintosh. Now, the Dynaco, I might uh, disagree with, uh, some of you guys may disagree with me on this. They rate this thing at 60 watts. I've never found one that really does a good 60 watts. And mostly you can get 50 watts out of it. We'll see what we get out of this one. But they are a darn good 40 watt amplifier. In my opinion, ever bit the rival of the Mac MC40. Okay, and then we'll do this one too. This one is one that I built some time ago. I think I made a seven part series out of it. But what I'm going to show you in all of these is this one is as stock a uh, uh, Williamson amplifier as I could get because the purpose of this amplifier, and it is absolutely a beautiful sounding amplifier, never heard one better. What I was interested in in this amplifier because I had six of these transformers at one time is I wanted to see if they, I was really, I really built this amplifier to evaluate these transformers. I wanted to see if they're as good as their reputation and they are pretty darn good. I was pleased. I won't say surprised, but I was very pleased. But I will say this, of the six I had, none, no two were exactly alike. I don't know if that's from aging. I don't know if they were born that way. I don't know if they were, um, you know, the QC on them was a little lax and whatever, but they're, you know, 50 plus years old. So anyway, we'll look at, we're going to look primarily at the tube driving these guys right here. We're always so obsessed with the output tubes. Well, you know, if starting here at the input, going through the first stage, the second stage, the driver stage. If that's not good, then what do we expect? It's got to all be good. Okay, now that that's done, and I think I've shown all I wanted to on this little Mac amp, let's go to the Dynaco right here. I'll have to stop, uh, reconfigure, and be back in one second. Okay, so what we have here is the uh, Dynaco Mark III, it's got an original design, 6AN8 driver. This is the way that it was built back in its day. It is a new board and new components. <clears throat> but I've added two things to it. One's called a DC balance, one's called an AC balance. It's still got its, its primary and original bias setting right there. So what you do, and I added these test points and a ground. So what you do is you put your meter into them, into either one, and you look over at the overall uh, voltage. Sorry about all this darn glare. So much, so much glare all the time. Sorry, let, let me let me let me turn it up. Um, uh, uh, maybe that'll help. 
this may be. Okay, 0.79, that's a little high. Let's move it over to this one. 0.79, well they're the same. So let's lower this just ever so slightly so we can get it around 0.7. What that is is 70 milliamps per tube because we are, we're measuring actually across a 10 ohm resistor. Now in this case, those 10 ohm resistors are very well balanced. They are, they are the same value. They are, I don't know if they're 9.9, .9, but they're exactly the same. You want to make sure that they're the same, or otherwise you're, these, what you're trying to balance here won't be balanced. Okay, now we got 6.98 on that one. We got. Uh, Okay, see it's off just ever so slightly. Not enough to worry about, but we're going to worry about it. And that, and that, that's where this little DC balance comes in. And we can change it just a little bit. Let's see. That's. Let's see if we can. We want to lower that one, don't we? So I turned it the wrong way. I'm just turning it. I mean, it's just a tiny bit. Okay, now we got seven oh six seven eight nine seven oh eight. And what is this one? Seven oh. Okay, we will raise that one. I'm doing this just just because we're all kind of crazy. So I want to be just a hair above seven. Seven oh three. Let's see what the other one is. Six ninety five. Well, you know how tedious do I want to make this? I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to drag this out, but I'm just showing you that what you can do um, is. Um, Going the wrong way. What you can do is, uh, is balance them. Now that, that, that's another thing that I've, I've really got to say something about. That 7.01. There's a. That's close enough. Let's, let's quit that nonsense. Uh, trying to set the currents of your output tubes to exactly a milliamp is futile because line voltage, tubes aging. You know, the moon and the tides, whatever. I'm being uh, just joking there, of course, but maybe not. Uh, the, the, the tubes are just so unstable that you're never going to get uh, a, a simple little amplifier like this to uh, stay at one milliamp. Okay, now we've got, so we set our normal, we set our basic range right here with the original bias adjustment, and then we balance them right here. Now, here's what the modification is. Here's the original schematic of the Dynaco Mark III. What I did is I took this resistor right here and removed it. Because you see there's that other one. You see there's that little asterisk right there that said we want these guys to be exactly the same. But well, we don't. We leave, we'll leave this one at 47 and we'll make this one variable so it'll go a little bit less than 47 and a little bit more than 47. So what I did is I'm going to mark down on this. I took this out and I put in this right here. I put in a 39K and a 20K pot. So I can go from 40K, thereabouts, to uh, 60K. So that gives me a range over this. This one will vary from 40 to um, 60, and this one stays fixed at 47. Now that's the dynamic range. That's not the one we just adjusted, but we're going to adjust that here in just a second. Now, this DC balance, all that that is, is all these components are left in right here. Nothing has changed here, but added from this point 0.1 right here to point 0.3 right here is uh, this circuit right here. It's a 500K pot. That's the one we just adjusted with a 1 meg off, off with a one meg ohm resistor off the ground. That allows you to slide this 1 meg ohm resistor up and down here. So you've got at least 1.25 meg here, 1.25 meg there. You're, you're not loading it. You're not going to hurt anything. But it allows you to uh, load one side just ever so slightly more than the other. And by changing, maybe this one right here, I'm just going to use number. Maybe this one needs minus 41.7. Maybe this one actually needs uh, minus uh, 40.3. It allows you to, to make these very slight adjustments and it balances because what we're doing over here is we have a 10 ohm resistor here and then we have a 10 ohm resistor here and they're off the ground and we're measuring right here across this resistor and right here across that resistor 
Where these resistors right here do have to be balanced. They have to be the same. You want a matched pair there for darn sure. And that way we have indeed balanced the cathode currents of these two tubes. That's what we just did. Now we have to put a signal into it and do the AC balance. Let me see if I can do this all real time. There's our input. Okay, yeah, it's actually working here. Oh, but this is not what we want to look at. There's our 14 watts. Oh, I've got to, uh, our distortion is way down, so we can see that it's working nicely. But I've got to, uh, I've got to hook up the oscilloscope. Right back. Okay, we have our scope probes hooked up to the uh, grids, just like I did in the little Mac amp a while ago. And we're looking at them over here. Uh, are they the same? Well, let's uh, sort of see. Let's move them here. And I've, I've actually unbalanced it on purpose. And let's uh, invert this one. Well, see, they're actually not quite the same. Let's amplify them a little bit. See, one's bigger than the other. That's pretty easy to see, isn't it? Now they're not distorted, so we've got a, we've still got a really good signal here, but they're but they're not equal. And if we add them together, let's see, let's uninvert them, let's add them together, and what we get is this. We get this one, which we can see is smaller than that one, and there's the error signal right there. There's the difference in the two signals when they're added. That's not right. Now, well, that's not the best. Okay. Now, I'm going to have to put this back on a tripod, and, and I'll show you. show you really I need to find on a tripod. I'm going to show too many things. Okay. Let's run our power up to some little bit higher level, maybe 30 watts. Let's say 40 watts. Okay, there's our 40 watts. Okay, let's crank this down and crank that one down. Okay, so there's our error signal right there. We want that to be a straight line. We can see that one's smaller than that one. And our THD is 0.7. Now, if I get over here on this, if I can see it, and um, put the screwdriver in there. Sorry for the fumbling, but I, uh, oh yeah, I think I got it in there now. Well, this is tedious. Okay, and I'm gonna start turning this. Look at there, look at our line straightening out. And I went a little bit too far. I don't have the perfect range on it, but I did go a little bit too far in one direction. I'd say that's about it right there. And look what our distortion dropped to. 0.28. Dropped from 0.7 to about 0.3. Same power. So does it matter? Indeed it does. Huh. Okay. And then if we uh, amplify these back up, and if we invert one of them again, and we start putting them on top of each other, look at there. They mesh. So you see, these are things that we can do. We can't change, we, we can't special order, you know, uh, at, least I don't, at least I can't, special order um, transformers. But, but these, these are adjustments that are not hard to make that really can trim out an amplifier very nicely and all we're doing right here is varying these two resistors right here I'll tell you what it'd be kind of whoops I'm sorry I get so excited here I don't know where my camera's pointing sometime we're, we're, we're varying these resistors I'm gonna turn the amplifier off unplug it and we're gonna measure the value of these resistors let's just see how different they are and it's gonna be unique to this tube somewhat you know what this perfect balance is but we did find the perfect balance and we could go either side we could go real far on one side and just barely on the other I hope you can see that that, that the line was you know we could actually cross the uh, the perfect straight line so uh, let's give this thing a couple of minutes to completely drain and then we'll actually measure the uh, these resistors okay and it took me a while to figure out exactly where I could find these things on the top. 
but we're going to measure this resistor right here and then this variable one right here. And what we'll see is this one is simply uh, pin 3 to ground. hope you can see that. That measures a 46.4K. Forty-six point five K, forty-six point four to forty-six point five, and the other one is from here. The other side of this little twelve pickle fairing. It measures forty-two point seven. So you see, they're not balanced. They're not exactly the same. And I'm, you see that in the Fisher amps. You see the results here. These are some really easy changes you can make that will improve your amplifier. Whether it be the Dynaco or not, be careful. Of course, you're dealing with a high voltage. I guess I gotta say that. Okay, well, with that said, let's move on to the Williamson amplifier and see what it looks like. Okay, here's us a Williamson stereo amp. I want to show it off just a little bit. Uh, I did add some more stuff to it. I put in a nice bottom. With some breather holes on it. I hope that's in the camera. Yeah. New tubes. I'm really fond of the the tungs all tubes. These are all 6SN7s and these uh, K, uh, tungs all KT66s. I'm gonna flip it over. I'm gonna take the bottom off, flip it over, and uh, hook it up, and we'll we'll take a look at it. Okay. Now here's the Williamson. Uses the it's the older design. It's this basically this design right here. It uses two 6SN7s, not the 6SL7. I, I always had I just had terrible results with the high mu triode here, that 6SL7. And I guess somebody else did too, huh? Heath Kit back in their day. So two uh, 6SN7s. I think I mentioned a while ago. Here's the two 12AU7 version. But this is basically what we have. Now I don't have any of these variable. I haven't I haven't modified this one per my own suggestions because that wasn't my intention of building it. But here it is hooked up and it's actually performing better than I thought. And there's its output. Very, very nice and uh, clean and a pretty much equal amplitude if we add them together. Get a nice straight line. We won't belabor this. And that's at uh, 20 watts. There it is again. Let's look at that one. Okay, now I'm going to start raising the gain right here, right here a little bit, and watch what happens here. Okay, you see, see those little dimples that come in there? Well, that, at least it's symmetrical, isn't it? But that gets cleaned up pretty darn good right there. There's its output again. If we keep driving it, we're saturating the tube. See, we're squaring off. Let's uh, increase the gain a little bit. Actually, this amplifier is performing really nice. We start seeing some crossover distortion in there, too. And that may be... See, see now, look what it looks like. I mean, that's pretty hideous, isn't it? That is just horrible. But with enough negative feedback, it comes out pretty good. If we crank it down a little bit to get rid of our notch distortion, and we just barely start to clip, we still got that nonsense in there. So can this one be improved? I am absolutely sure it can. Hey, that's at 1%. That, that, that's a good point. By the way, we're doing all of this at 2 kilohertz. Not for any particular reason, it's just at 23 watts. The other channel will do the same thing. So this could be improved, I think, by very simple modifications. Uh, I'd have to put uh, the pot in there to balance you know some uh, cathode resistors in there let's see these cathodes I believe are connected straight to ground pin 8 is the cathode well I can't follow it out you know, I'm not gonna stick my finger in there yeah I can see the wire going over there they're straight to ground no they're not no they're not this it this is a um, cathode bias they go over to here so that's that should we look at another one? Maybe so. I don't know. I think I'll drag that um, that old uh, Fisher 70A out here. These amplifiers are performing better than this one. Actually, I expected to be more unbalanced. 
but I think you can see that uh, cleaning up cleaning up the signal you, you want your signal to be clean from right there all the way to the grids of the tubes and don't just simply rely on this negative feedback loop to clean everything up for you it'll do a pretty darn good job and it'll sound fine but uh, you can improve the performance by keeping it clean from one end to the other let's go get the 70a and then uh, that ought to that ought to be a tour of vintage amps for, for one night. Okay, <clears throat> last but not least, here is a very nice old vintage uh, Fisher Model 70A. Here it is, uh, Fisher, upside down. It's uh, quite nice inside. I first experienced this amplifier uh, back when I was a kid, not this very one. I lived with my uncle up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. He was a chemist there, there at Oak Ridge National Labs. And he had one of these with that 50C preamp. And I just thought, wow, that is, man, that is a dream come true. If I ever get one of those, I will uh, have it made. Well, I, that's why I keep this one around, I guess, just kind of as a memento. Sounds great. It'll do a beautiful 20 watts. There it is right there, 20 watts. 0.3. This is a 2 kilohertz. Same as all the rest of them. Okay, and it has an adjustment just like I've been going over all night. There's 100K right there in the plate lead and the cathode. It has a 68K in series with a 50K. So it can be varied from 68K to 118K. You know, both sides of this one. And it works. If we, um, let's see, if we I'm gonna, here it is right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tweak it to one side. Okay, and there is our uh, signal again. This is one signal, there's the other. There, it's, it's in add mode. By the way, if some of you, uh, some of you are very observant and you might notice that one channel says 50 volts, the other one says five. The reason that is is because <clears throat> this probe right here has the little pin that, that shorts the, uh, uh, this ring by grounding this ring it it, it changes the, uh, the oscilloscope so we know it's got a 10x probe this one doesn't have that pin I don't know it's missing whatever but but they both balance out perfectly so there we go now if we balance this right here let's see what our THD is right now it's a half percent and if we balance this guy if we get them perfectly balanced and perfectly as we can. See, that's too far the other way. Look what our distortion went up to. Almost 1%. If we get this thing as tweaked in as we can, that's too far one way. That's, I guess that's about it right there. We get our distortion down to 0.35 now. Let's see, let's do it this way. Let's look at the distortion. Make the adjustment 0 0.36, 0 0.37, so that's the wrong way. 0.36. Yeah, well, see, just by straightening out that line, we, we, we did it right there. By getting that that added line as straight as possible, we, uh, we achieved the same thing as we did with a, with a high-end uh, distortion analyzer. So there you go. With, with an oscilloscope, a two-channel oscilloscope, uh, by, I hadn't thought about it, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to have all these pieces of equipment, but with a two-channel oscilloscope, you can actually make these adjustments uh, by, by adding the two and, and, and trimming the, uh, the added um, channel, the added trace, to uh, zero. So there it is. Let me uh, turn this little guy over. It's a pretty little thing. Let's disconnect the uh, the probes. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it over for you, I hope. And uh, show you what the other side looks like. Runs a pair of uh, 5881s or 6L6s. It's got some real nice... Uh, I'm going to unplug it. It's got some real nice little 
chunks all uh, tubes in it. 5V4, 12AT, 12AU7. These little potted transformers. Very, very nice sounding amplifier. Very nice. Well, I guess that's about it. Um, my goal tonight was to, one, say, you know, don't get too wound up in, in trying to um, determine exact impedances of, because there's not much you could do about it. Um, there was something I wanted to say also about, oh, about plate resistance. Not plate resistance, but plate load resistance. There is one thing I wanted to add there. Um, if we go into this manual right here again, let's go back to the 6L6 just for a second. 6L6. There we go. That's nice. And we go to uh, push-pull AB1. The the way that I've been, the way that I've seen many times about determining the plate load resistance of a push-pull amplifier is basically do R equals E over I. E is 300, 360. Let's get the calculator and I'll show you. There's a couple of thoughts on it, but here we go. Let's go there and do this one. Um, is this, uh, there's push-pull class A. No, yeah, here it is. Well, let's stick with the one we were on. 360 volts, because they're all going to come out to be the same. 360. If we want to determine R, we determine R with R equals E over I. So that's uh, E, 360, and I is the maximum signal plate current of, um, 205 milliamps, 0.205, divide that, and some counts say multiply it times 1.8, and some counts say multiply it by 2, and it doesn't really matter, because if we multiply it by 2, look what we get, we get 3,500 ohms, and 3,500 ohms, they say 3,800 ohms, so arguing this point is pointless, in my opinion, because you're going to use probably a 5,000 ohm transformer. You can do all of these calculations all you want all day long, but basically you will, you will get a working answer for effective load resistance plate to plate by simply doing R equals E over I, E plate voltage over I plate current and multiplying it times 2. And you will you'll come out as close as you need to be and as close as you're going to be able to get within a transformer. That's the way it seems to work. Well, thanks again, guys, for watching and, and all your comments and, and all your suggestions. And I learned something every time. And here's our lineup out here, uh, the amplifiers we've looked at tonight. And uh, even though back from my uh, soapbox speech earlier that we can't change many things, we can't change... Uh, these guys and what have you. There are a lot of things that we can change and we can, uh, and that are simple and they're cheap and they can make a considerable difference. So I hope this helps and uh, be safe. Thanks for watching. Actually, there's one more thing we've really got to talk about because I really need your thoughts on this. I've been asked to make a video on how to use a PC and software programs like Arda, like Spectre Plus, like, uh, let's see, I can't remember the names of them right now. There, there's a, an oscilloscope uh, program you can get. Let's see, we're, we're right now looking at uh, that little... Uh, amplifier. Got a lot, of, a lot of noise in there. There's some 60 hertz over there. It's all below 100 dB though, so it's okay. Anyway, how, you know, in, in, instead of spending thousands of dollars and, and, and having a, a huge workbench of, of equipment, like the Tektronix and the HP stuff, with, um, with some of the uh, scope programs that you can get to run on a PC and the 
uh, software programs, these FFT programs to measure distortion. I'd like to make a video on using the minimal amount of equipment so that there's no huge investment. We're going to assume that everybody has a PC. One of the things they will have to buy is they will have to buy them some version of a, uh, a USB sound card. They will have to get some version of a uh, FFT program. They will have to get some version of a dummy load or two if they want to do stereo and some attenuators so that you can attenuate uh, you know the uh, the output into the sound card or in for uh, FFT analysis or into the uh, PC audio channel audio inputs over here for an oscilloscope so that we can look at it with an oscilloscope so we can measure THD you know a whole platform a whole working legitimate platform built around a PC with the minimum but adequate but the minimum amount of components just those things I just went over and, and whatever else I might be forgetting so uh, PC scope that seems to be the one I keeps coming to mind I don't think that's the right name but if you have any um, suggestions any experience and you've used any of these programs I, I'm familiar enough with, with these uh, FFT programs but an oscilloscope program or and a signal generator gotta have a signal generator yeah I almost forgot that one you know all of the basic components that you would you could come in with your PC and just a handful of um, uh, like say the dummy loads and the attenuators what have you and proper cables you'll have to be able to make those kind of things up to make a uh, a, a full legitimate uh, measurement platform with a PC I would love your thoughts on that your experience what you've done what you know about and uh, so we don't have to have this and I think it can be done and I, I bet it could be done for very little money of course, assuming everybody has a PC to run it on. Okay, that's it. Thanks again. Okay, one last thing. Uh, this is just bragging stuff. I just got a grandstand here just for a second. Uh, I just got published along as a co-author of a, uh, a uh, article in the uh, Texas Dental Journal of a uh, energy output and in vitro biological effects of an ionic toothbrush right there it is and uh, there I am right there along with my uh, with my buddies the ones that I worked with I'm real proud of this first time I've been published since 1983 and I'm not the main author I am not the doctor in here uh, there it is again what it's about is some toothbrushes that have titanium dioxide um, uh, tips in it. It's, it's, it's not it's not hard reading, but I did the electronic and the you know how many electrons are flowing and all that kind of stuff. They, this is my chart here, and you know how many what the voltage, open circuit voltage, and short circuit current is, and all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm real pleased. I, I feel good about it. I'm, even at 67, somebody actually uh, still wants me to work with them. There you go. Sorry for the, sorry for the distraction here, but uh, still having fun.